All right, now Numbers chapter, or, yeah, Numbers chapter 25, we see here this, um, it's a really interesting story with, uh, with Phineas. We're introduced here to Phineas and, and, and what he does. Basically, is what, what's happening is, um, you know, the children of Israel go, start going a-whoring after other gods. And um, this is right after the, right around the time of Balaam. If you remember, um, the children of Israel were going into Moab, and the king of the Moabites was hiring Balaam, the son of Bosor, to come and curse the children of Israel, and he wouldn't curse them. But instead, he, uh, he blessed them because God would not allow him to curse the children of Israel. And um, so this is after that. This is with Baal Peor. And we, we find out later that, that Balaam had a part in this. But um, that's not what this story is about or what, what the sermon's about. What we're preaching on here is um, the subject of, my, of, of the sermon tonight, sit up straight. The subject of the sermon tonight is initiative and taking initiative and, and doing that which is right. So before we get into the story, let's just explain real quick real quickly that word initiative you think of your um, your initials for your name your initials are what the first letters of of your name right so my name is David Burzens my initials are D and B because those are the first letters of my name and to have initiative means that you're gonna make a start at something you're gonna uh, you know make take yourself and, and do something forward, you know, kind of of your own free will, and you're going to take the initiative and actually move forward and do it. And um, you're going to take the first steps into doing that. That's taking the initiative. Now, what we see here in this story with Eleazar, or with, I'm sorry, with Phineas, the son of Eleazar, Phineas takes initiative. He sees something that ought not to be. Now, the children of Israel were commanded, for one, not to intermingle with the heathen of the land. Not to marry their wives and, and to give your, your daughters unto them to be wives. They were not supposed to be doing this because what they were doing is they are going around and destroying the people of the land. And they were, they were taking over these, these nations. And um, what happens here, first is the children of Israel, they go into sin and start worshiping other gods. But then we see this brazen act. And it's in... Um, in verse 6, it says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the tabernacle of the, con of the congregation. These people are already upset. They turned from God. Here's the, uh, this guy shows up in blatant sin and just, just comes right out, comes right out in the open, right in front of Moses, right in front of everybody with this Midianitish woman who they, know, who they knew they were not supposed to be taking wives of the, of the heathen. And um, he's just right out in front of everyone, just, this is my woman, and, and not ashamed, not embarrassed, not trying to hide the fact that he was doing this. And it says, um, and when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. Phinehas sees this. He says, no, nah, this isn't right. This needs to be stopped right now because God was already bringing judgment against them. It says, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Phineas has a zeal to serve God. Phineas wants to stand up and do what's right. And the way he does that is he ends up killing this man, this man of Israel and this Midianitish woman to get the sin out of Israel and to, and to try to pacify God, and it works. You'd say, oh man, that's, that's terrible. You know, he killed somebody, which, you know, killing somebody is terrible. It's, not, it's never a, a pleasant thing or a fun thing, but sometimes that was needful. And, and look what happens here. It says, um, so the plague was stayed in verse 8 from the children of Israel, and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4. 20 and 4,000 people, 24,000 people died in the plague because of their sins. And then you have this guy just brazenly coming out, just ignoring God's commandments and, and not caring at all what God has commanded for them to do. Phineas sees this and says, uh-uh. He takes initiative. He doesn't wait for anyone to tell him, oh, we have to take care of this problem. He identifies the problem. He knows what the right thing is to do. And he executes it and takes care of it in that moment. And because he does that, because he had this zeal to serve God, God sees that and he liked that. 
He liked the fact that Phineas is not going to allow for this wickedness to continue to happen. And he stands up and he does what he has to do. And it says um, in verse 10, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, So now God's going to tell Moses why he likes this so much. Look at verse number 11. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. So because God was jealous, he was angry that they were worshiping these idols. They see, you know, Phineas has a zeal to serve God and execute judgment that, that God sees Phineas's heart, Phineas's actions, that he goes and does these things. And that is what turns God's wrath away from the children of Israel. This is what he tells Moses. And look what, what happens now because of this with Phineas. Verse 12, he says, Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Now that's interesting too because you know Phineas takes up the spear and he kills a couple people and in so in that act of killing he receives a covenant of peace and you know sometimes it's necessary for for righteous judgment to be executed that people do need to be put to death and unfortunately we're getting away from that more and more and more in today's society where people in general just the death penalty is almost non-existent even in the states where they still do um, do the death penalty it's almost non-existent. And unfortunately, the reason why it's unfortunate is because it's needful. God has put a punishment on certain sins, on homosexuality, on adultery, on kidnapping, on all these, these various sins that require the death penalty. That's what, just one of the very many reasons why society is going downhill. They're not proper judgment. It says here there are 24,000 people killed, yet Phineas receives this covenant of peace. It says, And he shall have it and his seed after him, and even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. And what's also kind of interesting about this story is that it says that the Israelite that was slain um, was Zimri, the son of Salu. So he was a prince. A prince is like... You know, one of the principal people, one of the principal men, one of the chief men, like a like a ruler in the in the in the country. He was a prince. He was someone high up. He wasn't just some nobody, so to speak, within the children of Israel. He was in a, in a had an official role to play. He was a prince, someone that was looked up to, as well as the Midianitish woman was a was a daughter of one of the chief people of Midian. So. These were people that today you might think, oh, they're untouchable because they're politically connected. You know, today's politicians think they can just get away with whatever they want because they're so well known and because they have connections and no one would dare do anything to them. Well, you know what Phineas said? That's wickedness. And he took the matter into his hands and he, and he executed the judgment that needed to be done. And it didn't matter that they were, it didn't matter to him that they were princes. It didn't matter what position they held. He saw their blatant disrespect for God and for God's word and went and handled that situation. He didn't wait around for someone to tell him what to do. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. We're going to see another example here. And, and again, remember, the, the, the theme of the sermon tonight, what I'm preaching on is taking initiative. So we see an example here of Phineas taking initiative. And his initiative had a lot of zeal. And, um, you know, obviously, th those are two separate things, having zeal and taking initiative. Both of them, you combine the two together, you could do a lot of great works. First and foremost, what we need, what I'm trying to, to preach on tonight is just ha taking the initiative, taking the first steps, you know, getting started doing what's right. You, oftentimes, people come to church and you can hear the Bible preach and hear the Bible preach and hear all this great stuff and agree with it and say, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. But then when it comes to your own personal life, you just start going back to your regular old habits, back to the things that you do. You don't think a whole lot during the week. You don't take the initiative in your life to start doing the things that you learn, to start taking action on the things that you know that are right and that are true. If you go through your life and never take initiative, you're never going to get anything good done for God. You have to take the first steps. You have to get started doing something in order to complete great works. You can never finish a great work if you never start it. And that's where taking initiative comes in. You're in Isaiah chapter 6. Look at verse number 8. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Here we see Isaiah taking the initiative when God's looking for someone. God's looking for a messenger. God's looking for somebody to be a preacher of righteousness. God's looking for someone to preach his word. And Isaiah is saying, hear my Lord, send me. He's willing to fill in and stand in the gap and, and make up the hedge for God so that God's wrath doesn't come upon people because we need to have this preaching. And now look, as with what happened in Numbers, you know, the, the job that Isaiah is, is signing up for, these aren't pleasant things to do. That's why there's hardly anybody doing them. That's why people aren't, aren't standing in the gap and making up that hedge. It's because they're not fun jobs to do, but we need to take that initiative. And, you know, the flesh is going to try to get you not to do anything, not to go out soul winning, not to read your Bible, not to pray. Your flesh is going to say, oh, I'm tired. Oh, I got things to do. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I've got everything else going on in the world. I don't have time to go soul winning. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read my Bible because I got so many other things going on. When you need to take the initiative and say, no, this is more important. I need to make sure that I'm getting out soul winning. I need to make sure that I'm going out and obeying God's commandments that I have in my life. Turn, if you would, in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, we're going to see Paul. There's just one example of the Apostle Paul. Paul was a man of great initiative. He got a lot of stuff done for God. He did not sit back on his heels at all. He's going around. He's traveling to new, new cities, into countries, and preaching God's word. He was a man of initiative. He's a man that worked with his hands to support himself as well as preach the gospel, as well as to go out and knock on doors, as well as to get churches started, and to do all that work. He simultaneously did both. That is a man of great initiative. But in Acts 17, look if you would in verse 16, the Bible says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So in this story, Paul's waiting. Paul's waiting for his friends to get there. And he's at Athens. And while he's in the city, he looks around and he sees this whole city is just given to idolatry. They don't know God. They're worshiping false gods. They have false idols that they're worshiping. And his spirit stirred up inside of them. Now, I want to ask you tonight, when you look around, when you walk around the neighborhood, when you go out and about, when you're shopping in the stores, and you see people who are obviously don't have God in their life, when you see the idolatry that goes on, when you see people walking into the Catholic Church, is your heart stirred? Is your heart stirred up to preach the gospel to them? Will you be willing to take the initiative to go out and preach the gospel to every creature? Are you willing to go out and knock on those doors? You need to take the initiative. You need to take the first steps. And here's the first steps. If you've never gone out and done this before, hey, find someone who has and go out with them and learn how to give the gospel. Learn how to preach it. But you have to take the initiative. Don't wait for someone to come to you. You need to hear, when you hear something truthful in the Bible, when you hear that we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, you should be able to understand that. And w when you agree with it, you say, okay, yeah, I can see that's written in Scripture. That's not enough. It's not enough just to agree with the truth. You have to do the truth. You have to walk in the truth. You have to walk in the Spirit. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians 3, verse 22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord of Christ. Now, the reason why we turn to the Scripture is because taking initiative is something that can help you in all aspects of your life, basically. It's not even just with the spiritual things. The Bible's telling us here, hey, if you're a servant, you know, you go to work, you work for a boss, put your heart into it. Don't work just as if somebody's watching you. You know, just because your boss is watching you, he's keeping track of, of how many things you get done, you know, 
And as soon as somebody looks away, you're just going to slack off and you're going to take a nap or you're going to go, you know, not do your work as hard. He says, no, don't do your work with eye service as men pleasers, as if you're just trying to please men. He says, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. When you go to work, whether, whatever that work may be, if you're a housewife, the work that you do at home, the work that you do for your husband, the work, if you're a man, if you go out to the job, and, and the work that you do for your boss, hey, whatever that work is, do it with singleness of heart, fearing God. He says that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. You have to remember throughout the day, throughout your work day, when you're doing work, be, you have to have the attitude of saying, you know what, I'm doing this for the Lord. This is the work that I'm doing for the Lord. And by the way, if you're working in a job or in a position that does not, that is actually contrary or against God. Now look, there's a lot of jobs that have nothing to do with God, but if you're like a bartender and you're serving booze, um, no matter how you do your job, I don't think that's going to bring any type of honor to God. God's not going to be pleased with that type of a work. But um, just in general, you should be doing it hardly as to the Lord. And think about that. If you're working as unto God and you're pouring beer for people, it's kind of hard to get your heart into that type of work as if you're serving God when you're actually serving the devil with that type of a work. But you need to, you need to work as if you are, as if God is your boss, as if God's the one that he says, okay, I need you to do this today, and you go out and do it. How would you respond if God tells you to do something? Are you just going to give him 10% of your effort? Are you going to give him 50% and say, well... Yeah, I'm going to play on Facebook for a while, and then I'll get around to doing my work. Don't worry, God. I'll get around to it when I get around to it. Are you going to be, um, you know, not caring, playing on your phone, doing whatever? Or are you going to say, no, this is the job I have before me, and I'm going to get my job done. And if I have any time left over after I get my work done, that'll be the time I use to, for enjoyment. If you're working as unto God, if you're working as unto men, it's a lot easier to, to have that type of an attitude because it's just for this person. It's just for this man. And, and a lot of times, you know, people don't have respect for their boss when they ought to. And they don't have, have respect for other men or other people. Well, if you're working as unto the Lord, you better have respect unto the Lord. It says, knowing that of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. See, God's going to see the work that you do. If you're working as unto the Lord, and let's say you don't make very much money at your job. You say, well, they're not paying me enough for what I'm making, for, for what I'm doing for them. My job is much more valuable. My work and the time I'm giving them and my efforts are much more valuable than they're compensating me for. Hey, don't worry about that. If you're working for the Lord, if you're working as unto Christ, then you don't have to worry about that because God's going to see your heart. God's going to see your work and he'll make things right for you. God will reward you. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have God reward me than my boss. Because I know that however God's going to re reward me, it will definitely be just and, and maybe even more and an extra blessing coming from God than I would get from just another man from, a, from, you know, from my boss at work or whatever. But taking the initiative, doing that type of work, having that type of an attitude, you know, when you're on the job, Take the initiative to take on new tasks. You know, if you're, if you're working, you're getting your job done, but because you're working so hard, you've got some extra time. Hey, don't just sit around and wait around. Take the initiative to start doing something else. Even if you're not told to do it, you know something needs to be done. When you see something that needs to be done, don't just walk by and not do it. Take the initiative to do it. Now, obviously, if you're working on something else, then, then keep focused on what you're doing. But if you're able to get through your work and you have extra time, hey, take the initiative. Take on something new. Go to the boss. I say, hey, what else can I do for you? Take that initiative. Take that step and God will bless you for that. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Again, this is going back to what I was preaching about earlier. Taking initiative is going to require you to take the things that you learn from the Bible and that's whether you're in church or whether you read it in the Bible at home. You need to be able to take what you learn and put it into practice in your life. And this all sounds good. Again, you could be sitting in church and be like, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I need to do that. But you need to do it. You don't just need to tell yourself, I need to do this. You need to actually put it into place. You need to actually put it into practice in your daily life. Now, whatever you need to do to do that, I don't know. You need to figure it out. 
and start doing it. You need to decide, hey, I'm going to start doing it right now. When I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to open up my Bible. I'm going to read it. Whatever it is, wake up early. Whatever it is that you need to do to get a jump start, you need to start doing these things that, that, are, that we need to do from the Bible. And it's... Um, you know, it's always great to do things, like if you're asked to do something, if you're told to do them, but, um, you know, assuming they're the right things to do. But it's even better when no one has to ask you, when no one has to tell you, when no one has to preach it from the pulpit, when no one has to do these things, you just take it upon yourself because you see it in the Bible, hey, that's what's good, that's what's right, that's what taking initiative is all about. And the Lord's going to see you doing that, and the Lord's going to bless that. Now, whatever it is that you decide that you're going to take initiative on, you know, like Phineas had a zeal and he took initiative and he did something. We need to make sure that what we're doing is according to knowledge. In Romans chapter 10, verse number 2 says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. We need to make sure that the things that we do to serve God, when we think we're serving God, that it is truly according to knowledge, that we're using God's methods, we're using God's ways. Hey, if we're going to say that we're going to you know, preach the gospel to people, well, how did God say to do it? How does the Bible give examples on how to do it? And we need to follow those examples, not just coming up with our own methods and um, saying, oh, well, you know, well, I'm going to draw this picture and then just give that to somebody. And, you know, it's got the whole gospel message in there. And, you know, no, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to use the word of God in order to get people saved. Now, turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter number 7. 2 Samuel chapter number 7. We're going to see here David. David was another, it was a great man of God that, that that had a lot of initiative, that wanted to, to do things, get things done for God. Second Samuel chapter number seven. Because we see here in this story that David had it in his heart that he wanted to build a house for the ark of God. David looks around and he says, you know, they're, they're establishing the kingdom they're doing all kinds of great works. They've, um, they've had some warfare. They're winning these battles. And he sees the ark and he said, you know, he, he loves God. He loves the word of God. He loves the ark. He loves the covenant. He loves all these things. And, and he sees, he's like, well, you know, why is the ark of God just in a tent? He's like, why is his tabernacle? We should do something more because, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's out of a right thing in his heart. And he did this the right way. Look at verse number 2 of 2 Samuel 7. The Bible says that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me in a house for me to dwell? And so, what, what David does, see, this is something new. Now, the ark has always been in this tabernacle since, since they had the ark, since Moses um, received that revelation from God on what God wanted them to do. And it has been this way this whole time. But David looks at this and says it's in his heart to, to build a house, to build a house of cedars. He's saying, look, but, but what he does, he doesn't just go off and do it. He has the initiative, he, he has the drive, he wants to do what's right, but first he goes and he says unto Nathan the prophet. So basically what he's doing, he's inquiring of God through the prophet. He wants to know if this is the right thing to do, if this is okay for him to do. It's in his heart, he wants to do it, but he wants to make sure what he's doing is right. So he goes to Nathan, and Nathan says, you know, go, do all that that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And Nathan probably answers a little bit too quickly there, because then God actually comes to him and tells him, no, this is actually the way it's going to be. And um, God explain. he goes through this whole explanation on, on, you know, he doesn't need a house and uh, he doesn't need a building made with hands. And, and, um, and basically explains that be he, he appreciates the fact that it's in David's heart, what he wants to do. So he's going to allow this to happen, but not in David's lifetime. He says, no, if you're going to do this, this is the way you're going to do it. And God still puts the way that he wants it done 
And David adheres to that 100%. David hears that. He says, okay. You know, and you got to imagine, David really wanted to do this. I'm sure David really wanted in his lifetime to, to build this house for God. But God said, nope, it's not going to be in your lifetime. It's going to be with your son Solomon. He'll be the one to build that, that temple. And David was great with it. He said, fine. So he went up, went out and, and gathered in all kinds of uh, materials and riches and the things that he was going to need in order for this to be built. And, um, and that's what David did with it. He did it according to knowledge. He, he got it from the word of God. Everything that we do when we're going to serve God ought to be coming from God's word. Now, if we're going to take initiative in our, um, turn if you would to Genesis 47, it's the last place we're going to turn. It's a shorter sermon this evening. But when you take initiative in your personal life, there, there's a lot of things that you need to analyze, first of all, from your own life. Are you doing these things? And if you're not, you need to take initiative and make a plan for yourself. So number one is reading the Bible. Are you reading your Bible daily? Are you reading your Bible? Have you read your Bible ever from cover to cover? Have you read the entire Bible, um, front to back, every single page. And if you haven't done that, then that's step number one. You need to do that, and you need to take initiative and say, you know what, I haven't done this before. I'm going to make a plan. Right after church, I'm going to make this plan. I'm going to decide in my heart that this is what I'm going to do, or tomorrow I'm going to start doing this. But you have to start. Initiative is that initial getting started. Once you get started doing anything, hey, it gets a lot easier from there. I remember going out soul winning. It was really hard to get started doing that. But once you get this routine set, once you get something going, once you initiate the first time doing it, then it becomes easier and easier and easier. There's something about just breaking through that ice, getting through to that, to that first step, getting through to that first door. Once you get, and I've noticed this too, now I'm a lot more comfortable. I don't get, get nervous when I go out soul winning anymore. It's a lot more, it's a lot easier. But when I first got started out soul winning, I remember not wanting people to come to the door. I remember not really wanting to talk to people and, and, and you know, not having the boldness that I needed, but I was still going out and doing it because I knew I needed to do it. And every single time without fail, once I talked to somebody, once I got through that first door, it's like, all of my concerns just went away and it wasn't nearly as, uh, I wasn't nearly as anxious or, um, or as fearful after you kind of get started and get going into it. But it takes that initiation, it takes that first step of doing it. Hey, if you're going to be reading your Bible, if you're going to make a plan to read every year, it's going to have to start with the first day of doing it. Now you ought to persist through that, but if you don't get started, you're never going to do it. Um, one of our church members, Sebastian, he took a great step of initiative when he, uh, he came to me one, one time after service and was telling me that, you know, he speaks Polish and he was looking for a Polish Bible that, was, that lines up with the King James. He said, because the only one that he could find is the newer version that's kind of like the NIV in Polish. And so he took it upon himself. He took the initiative to just decide that he's going to go and, and um, he's going to try to get a copy of the of of the writer the the more correct the more accurate version of the Polish Bible in print again. So what he's doing now is he, he's find he found it online, and and he's trying to convert it, and he's basically gonna gonna publish or print his own Polish Bible so he could have it. And that's something that he decided on his own that he took the initiative to do it. He started taking the steps. He saw something. Hey, this is a problem. We don't have the word of God in my la in this language, in the language of Polish. And, and I'm sure he wants to go and talk to his family and talk to friends that maybe they don't speak English quite as well and be able to give them the gospel. But it's hard to do if you don't have God's word in that language. So he took it upon himself to take the initiative to go and do that. And these are the things that we need to do in our daily lives. When you notice something isn't right, when you notice there's a, there's a lack of something or there's a need for something, whether it be souls being saved, like I said, whether it's your own knowledge of the Bible, whether it's your prayer life, whatever it may be, you need to take the initiative and fix that problem. And even in the smallest of things, whether it be spiritual or not, don't have this attitude. This is an attitude that drives me nuts when people say, well, that's not my job. That's not my job. This, this type of attitude where, and I see it oftentimes at work, you know, where, where people, they're not that busy doing anything else, but they don't want to do this specific task because that's not my job. I'm not going to do that. And 
<clears throat> this is a type of attitude that, for one, the boss never likes to see that. The boss doesn't want to see someone come in and just have this attitude of like, well, this is all I'm hired for and this is what my job is and I am not going to do anything outside of that. When you're willing to take on other things, when you're willing to do the work, if your boss tells you to do something, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to say, well, that's not in my job description. When you stop having that attitude, it's because really all that is is just kind of a proud attitude. When you can humble yourself and say, you know what, I'm just going to do what needs to be done. I'm going to be a team player. I'm going to, I'm going to work together to do what's right. And, and it doesn't matter if this is what I was hired for, but I'm going to do this job. Or even like outside of the job, right? The place where you meet for church, where you, meet, where you congregate together. Um, you know, we all come together here. We all worship here. Um, this is something that we should all have respect for. And if you see trash laying around the church room, if you see, you know, whatever, something's out of order, hey, fix it up. Don't just walk past and say, oh, someone else will do that. We're all, we're all in this together and, and we're here for a common goal and really the church that's here is for everybody. Um, now, we have people that, will, that, that are designated to take care of these things, but you, know, you shouldn't just rely and just say, oh, well, that's someone else's job. No, you step in and just do it. And you know what? God's going to see that and, and He'll bless that. If you, if you have that type of an attitude, you're going to be making someone else's job easier for one, but for two, it's just the right thing to do. Now with soul winning, as I mentioned earlier, maybe you've never been before. Don't wait for somebody to ask you to go out soul winning. You need to take the initiative. If you've seen that it's right, you need to make sure that you step up and, and, and say, and either go at the, at the soul winning time that's published in the bulletin and say, you know what, I've never gone soul winning before. I know it's the right thing to do. You take that initiative. You take that first step and come on out. Now, maybe you have been soul winning before. Maybe you're comfortable with it. And you know someone that hasn't been soul winning before. Hey, take the initiative to ask that person to come. You say, yeah, but you just said, don't wait for someone to ask you. Yeah, I know. But some people still, if they don't take that initiative, you go ask them to come. You go invite people out to come soul winning with you. You bring it up in conversation. You try to help that brother or sister out to, to become closer to Christ and to do more things that they're supposed to be doing. If you see a lack there, hey, invite them out. Don't just say, oh, well, they shouldn't need for me to ask them. Yeah, you're right. But they still might be waiting for someone to ask them. You can't just, just, just say, well, that's not my responsibility. That's like saying, well, you know, the, the people that want to get saved, maybe should just come into church and just drag their butts into church and then they'll get saved. No, you need to go and bring the gospel to them. And um, should they come into church and get saved? Yeah, of course. But it doesn't mean they all are. So either way, if you've never been before, hey, don't wait for someone to ask you. And if you have been before, find someone who hasn't been before and, and just gent, you know, politely ask them and say, hey, do you want to come out soul winning with me? Maybe that's all they're waiting for. Maybe that's all they need is just a little bit of a nudge, just a little bit of a push. Take the initiative. Take the responsibility upon yourself. Now, maybe the scheduled times don't work for you. Take the initiative. Plan a separate time. Talk to other people in the church. Say, hey, I really want to go soul winning, but these times don't seem to work out for me. Are you willing to come soul winning with me at such and such a time? I have, I have off of work at this time. I can go now. Are you able to go with me now? And, um, and take that type of initiative. All kinds of things. You'd be starting a nursing home or a jail ministry, going and, and visiting the, the fatherless and the widows, as the Bible says, as pure religion, as undefiled. Going out and doing those things. Don't wait for someone to ask you to do those things. Don't wait for someone to tell you to do those things. Hey, if you know what's right, it's in your heart, go out and do it. Start doing that. Maybe you have some skills that can be beneficial to the church. You should offer up those skills. Think about what you can do just to help our church grow, to help the church in general. Maybe you're good with computers and you can help with the website. You can help get sermons posted online. You can do all these other things. Hey, if you're good at that, offer up that skill. Hey, maybe you like visiting elderly people. Find the elderly people in the church. Why don't you go just be a blessing for them? Why don't you go take them some food or do you know help them clean up or do something nice? Maybe there's some repairs that need to be made. Maybe there's some cleaning that needs to be made. Whatever it is, you say, hey, I can do that. Well, take the initiative. Take the first steps. Approach the pastor. Approach someone and say, hey, I want to do more. I want to help. What can I do? 
Oftentimes, people have a willing heart. They just don't know what to do. Hey, if you have a willing heart, don't just sit back and wait. You don't know if someone, you know, someone else might not have any idea that you have a certain skill. You have no clue. You need to offer that up. Take that initial step. And, and whether it be something that's, um, that needs to be formalized or not, if it's not something that needs to be formalized, then just, just do it. Just fill the role and, and um, fill that gap that's, that's missing there. Take it upon yourself. And this is one of the reasons why I even why I even became a pastor at all. It's never been, you know, my life's desire to pastor a church. But what I notice and what I've come to see through through visiting, you know, all around the country, visiting various churches, and um, just talking to people in my own experience, trying to find a church, it just seemed that there 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 was lacking some good biblical preaching and teaching and, and people who weren't afraid to preach the Bible and, and who actually can expound and read lots of Scripture and back up what you're saying with the Bible, there seemed to be a big lack of that. And it got to the point where I'm saying, well, look, if I'm not going to do this, who's going to do it? And you ought to have that same mentality. Hey, if you decide I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to go out sowing, I'm not going to read, you know, whatever it may be, who's going to do it? Some things we're commanded to do and some things were not, and the things that were not, hey, if you don't do those things, who's going to do them? You're in Genesis chapter 47. Did I have you turn there? Genesis 47. This is our last scripture, Genesis 47. Very simple concept to get down today. It's just taking initiative on things. You need to get started. You need to get a start on the things that you learn from the Bible, whether that be in church or at home. You need to be able to take that start. You need to, to put the Bible into practice, you, whether it be making a schedule for yourself, what, whatever it is that's going to get you started, you have to just get started. Once you get started doing something, then it, then it will usually work itself out and, um, and fall into place. And I'm hoping that this sermon can help you more than just in your spiritual life, spiritual life primarily. But even more than just in your spiritual walk, just in, in, as in your daily life, whether it be on the job or whatever, take an initiative. You know, even around the house, I, I try to do this. I'm not perfect. Look, nobody is. But when I walk past some garbage on the floor, I, don't, I try not to just walk right past it. I'll, if I see something needs to be done, I'll pick it up and throw it away. You know, taking that initiative, having that type of approach where you know, it'll keep you from getting lazy. The last thing you want to do is get lazy. Look at what it says here in Genesis chapter 47. Look at verse number 5. It says, And Pharaoh, this is right when Joseph and it brings all of his family into Egypt during the famine. It says, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. So Pharaoh's saying, look, any of the men of activity, people who are active, people who are actually doing things, getting things done, taking initiative, getting the work done, hey, those are the people that I want watching my herd. Those are the people I want working for me. And God's basically going to be the same way. When he sees somebody willing to work, that's not going to be lazy. That's not going to sit on their rear end. It's not going to wait for someone else to get things done. If you're out there and you're pushing yourself and you're staying up late reading the Bible and getting up early and going out soul winning and praying and doing all the things that need to be done and just making sure you're staying active and taking initiative on these things, getting new things started, getting new ministries started, whatever it may be, if you're going to be a person of activity, hey, God's going to make you a ruler. And that's a fact. You are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium based on your works, based on how much work you put forth for God. And you will not have any work to show for God if you don't take initiative, if you don't get started. You will accomplish so much with your life if you're able just to take an initiative and to keep yourself active doing the right things. Don't let yourself take a break. Don't slip back. Just, just keep yourself going and going and going and pushing forward. Try not to get distracted with the cares of this world, with, with these things that, that are just going to try to drag you down and try to keep you from doing 
the most with your life that you can. And the more that God sees you doing with making do with what you've got, the more he's going to give unto you. And one day when we pass away and when we enter into God's kingdom, you'll be ruling and reigning. And, and it, it'll be as a result of you proving yourself with the things that you already have and being active and taking initiative. If you get one thing down from today's sermon, which I've, I've been pretty repetitive um, tonight, if there's, whatever, analyze your own life. Analyze your own spiritual life and your own just regular work life. Both. Look at both individually. Look at them both separately. Try to figure out what it is that's lacking. Whether it be Bible reading, praying, sowing, whatever that is. Figure it out what it is for yourself. You know your own self. And decide tonight that you're going to take initiative and action on fixing that area of your life that, that isn't quite doing so well. Say, I'm, gonna I'm actually going to take the steps. I'm not just going to hear the words and not do them and be a forgetful hearer. I'm actually going to take what I've heard tonight and put it into practice say, hey, you know what? I am going to get started on this and I'm going to do it tomorrow. And if you don't, then this sermon was basically meaningless for you. If you can't take initiative on something, then it's worthless. Don't make it worthless. Um, take these stories that we've learned from God's Word and, and, and see that the, the way that these people um, were able to do great works for God and to be pleased by God, um, apply that to your life and taking the steps to get things done. Let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your Word. God, I pray that you would please help us all to take the initiative in our life to, um, to do that which is right, to identify what's lacking, dear Lord, and help us also not only to have an initiative, but to have zeal and to be excited, to get excited about serving you, to get excited about doing the things that we need to do. And also, dear Lord, help us to do those things according to knowledge, not just in a great zeal, but also um, according to knowledge that we're doing the right things, so we're not just spinning our wheels. But... Um, God, I pray that you please just give us the wisdom to understand the things that we need to do and help us to honestly view our own life and identify those areas. Help us out with those problems, dear Lord, and, and help us to just get started on fixing them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.